All right, why don't we uh, call to order the uh, Operations and Management Committee meeting. Um, first of all, we need to uh, do attendance. Amanda? Hi. Ben? I'm here. I'm here too. Okay, so we're all good. Um, we have um, a couple uh, action discussion items. The first one is approval of KETS K-12 operational technology needs for school year 2019-2020. And uh, David is going to do that for us. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm also joined by uh, Marty Barkey, our chief digital officer, and works in our office. In fact, most of the other people in our office as well. Um, Mike Lettingham and Lisa Moore Scott, of course, with CTE. So uh, you're amongst friends uh, Good. Uh, here. So just let me give some of some opening comments, and then we'll take any questions that you, that you have. I hope we'll answer a lot of your questions. And so. Uh, so since 1992, the Office of Education and Technology, our office, um, annually reminds the Kentucky Board of Education of the expected annual basic uh, technology need of Kentucky K-12 schools for the next school year, and that's $366 million. And it's based upon the most recent version of the CATS Master Plan that the Kentucky Board of Education approved. It's the 2018 to 2024 uh, Master Plan that the Board approved in 20. Uh, 18. We also make the, the Board of Ed uh, aware of the federal and local um, and state resources, including the CATS funds, and that's the 15.4, that's anticipated to be available for the following school year. Um, so the grand total is $267 million. They go toward addressing that annual uh, ed tech need, although the CATS portion of the 15.4 is obviously a very small portion of that. Uh, the third thing we do is we recommend that the Board of Education move forward with both of those expected uh, annual uh, need costs um, as identified by the CATS Master Plan of $366 million and the, and the CATS Operational Resources, and that's $15.4 million that's been appropriated uh, by the legislature to our office to help part of, be part of addressing those needs. These two costs, the $366 million, and the 15.4 million are identical to what the board approved in these same two staff notes last year. Our districts are very supportive with moving forward those staff notes. Like last year, there isn't anything controversial related to either staff note, and there won't be strong pushback by the students, teachers, and school leaders that we serve by moving forward with either of these staff notes. The first and only sentence in each staff note under the commissioner's recommendation is what we're asking for approval for. As some FYIs associated with this, in the, in the private and public sector, approximately four to six percent of their available resources goes toward acquiring basic technology projects and services for their staff. The $366 million in the CATS Master Plan represents just four percent of all the Kentucky K-12 resources. So we're on the very lowest side of identifying basic technology needs. However, in reality, we only expect to have a total of $267 million being spent the next school year from all the available Kentucky K-12 funding resources at the local, state, and federal level. Once again, we are just making the board aware of all the possible funding resources, and you're not being asked today to approve $267 million, since nearly all that money is being appropriated federally and by the state legislators that go directly to school districts. This $267 million is very similar to the 266 million estimate that we listed in last year's staff note that turned out to be very accurate. Also, the 267 million in expected ed tech spending this next school year in Kentucky K-12 is below just not the 4%, but also below 3%, which is one of the reasons we have submitted additional budget requests that we talked about a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier. The 15.4 million appropriated to, to KD in our office, and I'm asking you forward to today, uh, provide basic but crucial services that our school districts value and is obviously a small fraction of the 366 million. So it's a 4% of the 366 uh, million and just 5% of the 267 million that we know of money that's going to go be able to spend uh, the next school year. Over the, over the past 25 years, we believe we've been very good stewards of the taxpayer funds and providing meaningful, helpful, and value services to our school districts and KD agency. Those specific CATS funds, the 15.4 million. Also over the past 25 years, we've never had a major negative issue with any of the funds that we're responsible for, uh, an inappropriate use of it uh, related to these CATS funds. 
Just some reminders about the CATS master plan and why it's so important. And a lot of this is based upon the master plan that uh, the board approved. It went through a 12 month creation and approval process that was presented and given a double thumbs up in 2018 from all school districts, the general public, the Department of Education, the Board of Education, and the legislature. So it's considered by reg, a uh, reg by reference, and has the teeth of law behind it. So the $366 million in technology need for the school year, and the catch product standards that are, give us a snipping edge on the other 49 states are part of those that, that having that teeth. So let me give you some examples of the product standards. They help drive down costs, give it a tremendous efficiency gain. We have tremendous financial uh, or, or cyber security, and we're the only state in the country uh, and this is a good thing, that has a standardized financial management system, school information system, and internet system. And I gotta tell you, my peers, the other 49 states wish they had that. Uh, it's something you would see more common in the corporate sector. In my experience in the military, it's near, it, it doesn't happen in K-12. And uh, the Ed Week article that I talked to a little bit earlier talked about the dysfunction that you have in the other 49 states because they, they made their own financial management system I think the state of Texas has 100 different financial management systems. And the difficulty of keeping those up to date and getting meaningful data is an important edge that we have in the other 49 states besides just driving down the cost and make it more efficient for teachers to go between schools and not have to be retrained in it and the student records going back and forth between the schools. Uh, the 2018-2024 master plan also clearly identifies the specific requirements of ed tech planning. And so I know during our pre-call we talked about planning. It gets very specifically the things we're wanting in ed tech planning and being part of the district's overall education plan that's required of every school district. It also provides our master plan the details of studies and audits and research that are related to Kentucky K-12. We've had a lot happen over the past 25 years and they're all right there for folks to take a look at. We also provide the studies and reports and research for K-12 beyond Kentucky. We also spent a lot of time in the master plan identifying strategic areas of ed tech emphasis for the next five years. Um, and they're identified with specific items that we want to continue to do well um, in and areas we want to improve in. So we identified 37 of those as a major area of emphasis. We had 22 of those were areas of acceleration. Those are areas that we're doing extremely well that we consider very important we want to keep on doing. And 15 areas of improvement. We also use this board meeting and this committee meeting as an opportunity to annually make you aware of or answer questions in regards to the current status of education technology readiness of our districts and current initiatives that we have going on in Kentucky K-12 technology. So annually, the Department of Education is provided access to the technology activity reports produced in use. Once again, we're the only state in America that can do this because they all got so many different financial management systems they can't track really what they're spending on technology in Kentucky can. We also have a digital readiness report. With this is district feedback directly from district ed tech leaders. We also ask questions directly of students, teachers, and parents, and that's represented in the infographic that, you, that you've seen. We also get feedback, and it's required feedback, from all 172 districts. And identifying what we are doing well in the past year, what we didn't do well, and we should focus in on in the next calendar year. And that does also drive our work and make sure we remain relevant uh, to school districts. We've also included in your packet what I call our greatest hits album from 1992 up to now in 2019. <coughs> um, Kentucky K 12 is the pioneer and national leader in most aspects of education technology. So, this is a list of our Grammys and our Oscar and our MVP trophies. I do think it's important for our Kentucky K 12 schools, students, and parents and leaders and general public to be aware of the things we've done very well and the importance of continuing to do those things well. However, we do recognize that we can always improve and have done, and have done so in the past 25 years, which has allowed us to remain relevant to districts and make changes and stay in tune with what they need from us. We also have, and I think that um, um, Chairman Hunter talked about this in the pre I have Marty Park here, and he talked about this being a tangential subject, but Marty is ready to talk about uh, the computer science availability in our schools uh, with our computer science and IT Academy, our work with Scott and the rest of the CT team on computer science. <coughs> We're also very proud Kentucky has more girls in the Girls at Code Club than anyone in America, which has led to our growth 
a pretty significant growth in a number of, of, of schools that have an increase in computer science being taken. Not where we want to be, but we're very proud of that. Uh, the role that SKLP, our Student Technology Leadership Program, plays in that. We have the best program in the country, uh, and definitely it's a good showpiece for what, what we're doing and the value added of, of technology and instructional process. Um, and it's also some recent staff, so Marty's prepared to, to go over those. And lastly, as a reminder, later this month, you'll be updated on our annual <coughs> Kentucky K-12 Cybersecurity Health, Death, Health Check Report. I can tell you, and I've told you in the past, that we get a minimum of 4 billion attempted cyber attacks upon Kentucky K-12, and the number is rapidly growing. The good news is an extremely small number of those 4 billion attempted attacks has led to data breaches in our schools. In an average year, that number is three to five successful breaches, but it has been slightly larger this past year due to the bad actors ramping up and improving their social engineering techniques. And so they're getting better at tricking a person then giving their, their, and, and, and to giving their password. They're tricking them into pretending to be a vendor that they need to be paid. They're tricking them to say that acting like they want their direct deposit location changed to another bank and it's not really the person that's asking for it. They're pretending that they want computers to deliver a certain location. It's not really uh, them at all. Um, and so that is definitely ramped up and we've had some success with that in Kentucky and that's what we call social engineering. They're not breaking through our technical systems and going back through it, because we have such product standardization, and I, I don't say it's the best in American K-12, not we're far from perfect, uh, but we have really limited the success of the cyber attackers. So now they're going more to working on the people side of that. And that's where a big part of our effort, uh, what we spend on just cyber security and cyber safety, we're also working on the people side of that, um, of trying to do something about it. So Marty was part of an initiative to create a digital driver's license for our students and our adults. Uh, it was a partnership with the University of Kentucky. Um, his efforts uh, have been adopted by the other 49 states, but they also help us in a good way to make our adults and students much more cyber savvy. We also create a document called It Can Happen to You, But Don't Let It. Uh, these are incidents that actually happen in K-12. We try not to name the specific district. You know, we don't want to embarrass them, but we want others to learn that this is happening because cyber, the, the cyber attackers count on the embarrassment of no one wanting to share and therefore they can keep on doing it to others. So we share it in a meaningful way. But we also take lessons learned from other K-12s and other higher eds of, of, of what's been happening and ways to, to address it. So that's, a, that's an opening. Uh, just uh, wanted to share a lot, a lot, uh, that's uh, <laughs> a lot, uh, a lot with you. Um, as I said, usually um, this is just to bring up the speed of what we've done, and I appreciate that opportunity of here, what, we, what we've done with it. What more questions do you guys have? What's been the nature of the uh, hacks that were successful? What kind of damage did they do? Well, um, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, uh, and then without giving the district names, and I can, you'll see in the report that you get specific district names. But uh, what we're seeing is the cyber hackers are, are studying, because we're supposed to be transparent, and that's a good thing, but they're taking advantage of that. They're studying who's paying who. They're studying our chain of commands. They're, they're, they're really studying. So their communications aren't like they were before. We could tell it was way off base. Um, and so, you know, for example, in Scott County, this is an example, um, is they pretended there, there's a new school being built in Scott County. And so someone studied very closely the patterns of payment of their vendor mm -hmm. and the timing of it. And so they sent a bill to them a couple of days ahead when it normally would, hoping it really wouldn't draw the attention. And so I think Scott, I think it was $3.5 million. Does that sound right? I mean, it's some kind of big number. So Scott County unfortunately paid the wrong person. Now the good news is, uh, this is one in a million. The person that was supposed to be paid said, I didn't get paid yet. What's the deal? And the person on the Scott County side, and that email could have sat for one or two weeks really looked at it and go, what do you mean you didn't get paid? I just sent you $3.5 million. So because of that, even though the payment had gone forth, the, the, the bank on the East Coast had not sent the money yet overseas. So it was, it was stopped. Uh, the gender, the, how they're working on the, um, the change of direct deposits is pretty clever too. They've studied the sequence and the processes, who approves what to change your bank account location. And, and so they're going to the normal person in the district and, and once again, i got to tell you this, or take advantage of the good nature of people that want to help. So the nature of K-12, they want to be very helpful, and very, very quickly to be very helpful. 
Um, and so they studied that process, and then so normally this has not been a problem. It, it really is the person requesting it. I always tell folks when someone's saying to change their bank location to South Dakota, it's a probably pretty good sign that's not really a, you know the, the person. But that's happened, I wouldn't say more than more than once here in Kentucky. Of course, when the person doesn't get paid, they said, "Where's my money?" And they, so the step that's being taken, we're telling school districts, is I know it slows down the process, but when someone wants to change their direct deposit location, they probably need to tell you that face to face. Something that you really know that it's them. Um, the ordering happened up in North Kentucky, at Northern Kentucky, and these folks are getting pretty bold. They pretended to be the school district, had it delivered to a warehouse not too far away from the school district, a bunch of Apple computers. And so the school district is getting that bill and going, what do you mean? I got to pay for these. I didn't order these. So they actually had them delivered to a warehouse close to the district, make it look like it was really the district. First, we got Apple involved, and then you know the tracing back uh, of it being involved. But it's something a technique called phishing, is what it is. It's someone pretending to be someone that they're not. And so we're just telling people to be, you know, very savvy. No one is going to ask you from the technology arena to share their password with them in the clear. Nobody. If they do, it's a horrible practice. Don't give it to them anyway. But, but these, that, that's the technique that is called, like, like say, social engineering. But it's, the part that's getting worrisome is they're using the names, the right names, the right timing. So it shows you someone's really, under, really closely watching the K-12 process and really trying to take advantage of that. And so what we're trying to do on the other side of that is, as I mentioned, the digital driver's license. Everything we tell folks, anybody that deals with money, anybody in a senior leadership position, Anybody that's around what I call top secret data should be required to get their digital driver's license. Now, we can't force that. There's no law behind it. We're going to do that here in the agency. But that's what I'm telling superintendents is a best practice because the things that are happening are covered exactly in a digital driver's license. Exactly. The scenarios, the examples are given. And it takes about an hour, an hour and a half to go through and get your license. It doesn't take a long time. What is a digital driver's license? I'm sorry. Uh, it's a partnership that we formed uh, with the University of Kentucky College of Education. It's a learning module. It's, it's going through a series of learning modules um, to kind of get up to speed on appropriate, responsible actions while digitally connected. Uh, and so we touch on cybersecurity, we touch on um, digital relationships, what that can and should look like, and appropriate, responsible. We touch on uh, uh, digital uh, financial transactions. So interestingly enough, Finland, I think, does an excellent job with that. I'm sure you agree, right? Because they, they actually have classes where they're teaching students how to be, how to decipher when they're getting hacked, yeah. and, and then also how to figure out real news versus fake news. Yeah. I, I think the other part of this, I always, the way I explain it, Marty can explain it in a more sophisticated way, but um, I always say this, and I, you know, having four children, I battle with this too. It's keeping your good people skills and social skills while being immersed in a technology society. And all of us get, I do see, I mean, I, obviously one of the concerns as a parent and just someone in general is the smartphones. Um, and, you know, Marty has, the, you know, the stats of, you know, for a long time, I, and my, my son used this against me. He says, I'm, Dad, I'm the only kid that doesn't have a smartphone. <coughs> and he got the dad, he was right. Um, and so I had a flip phone, but I said, why do you need a smartphone with a pure, like, but the ages are getting younger and younger and younger. Um, and and as, even now, I asked Marty to look at this, he gave me a stat for third graders, which is alarming. They have not a flip phone, they have a smartphone. So about 95% of the uh, high schoolers, the like 12th graders have it, um, which tells you probably the other 5% has something to do with they just can't afford it. But even the lowest income, Almost everything is getting it. But what percentage of third and fourth graders? It was 37%. I mean, third graders. I mean, what does a third grader need a smartphone with? So obviously, we're wanting folks, and, and when you see folks not interacting face to face is enough. Um, there, you know, people are breaking up by text, not by face to face. And so they're 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 not learning the proper coping skills and interacting skills. So that's part of what this is too, and we want parents aware of is. And because parents have a big part of this. We don't run out of their home with their smartphones and, and what they're getting into. And, and to be honest with you, the most violent acts uh, that we see that would be planned against themselves or others are most likely happening through their smartphones because we have things in schools that would make it very, very difficult for that to occur. 
And so we're trying to get you know parents much more aware of this in their home. But digital citizenship goes a long way. Uh, we think try to make people aware of it. So do you do you think the budget supports the security that you need? Well, I would say this is at, at this time, but we see the growth. And that's why you're seeing part of that budget, the additional budget request, is about helping us deal with cybersecurity. Okay, um, so the, and, and then you had earlier said the two, $267 million is, you're, you're fairly comfortable that would be a repeat. Yes. Because it was 267 yeah. last year. So we're and, 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 and the history you've had over the past 20 some years seeing it and predicting it has been pretty accurate. Okay. And then um, the 15.7, that's that you're, that's the number really we're going to yeah. today. Yeah, that's really the bottom line the number. And it's a similar one uh, last year. It's been that way for quite some time. And then going through the groups consulted, everyone, you know, there, there's a list of what, six or seven different groups you've consulted. They're all with it. Very supportive. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then the last question I have is, um, and, and this is kind of off the wall, but Idaho's remote education, will our, will our backbone support remote teaching and, and driving that further? So, uh, Omar, are you ready to yeah. take yeah. off? Yeah. So, so um, i just take you from the beginning, and I'm going to let Marty get up on this, because um, I always think it's been important to you, even from the beginning, is when Kentucky became the first state to have television. Um, to every classroom was a pretty big thing. Then phones in every classroom. And then we had the internet. So it really gave you the ability, the teacher ability, uh, to bring in anyone to help out in their classroom, whether it be an expert in some kind of field. But also, if there's a certain subject that you couldn't or felt comfortable with, you could bring them in. But we have other things like PBS Learning Media that can help out with that as well. We, we have seen certain instances of it being used. Um, I think some of the inhibitors of, of it are just not the teachers, but who pays, like the teachers, who gets credit for the teachers and who pays. And it comes, comes down to it. I think there's a willingness to share, but as I've viewed it, I think, I think they go, well, who pays for this if I'm, if I'm, if I'm doing that? But, but, but infrastructure-wise, just like online testing, we think this is an enabler. And we've always tried to be positioned to take advantage of that. Uh, because as I grew up in Eastern Kentucky, there's a lot of things I could not have normally gotten access to and, and be honest with you and I thought I had a pretty good education at, at the school but to be honest with you when I went to West Point compared to my peers I was behind um, and so and there were normally courses and I thought I was hot stuff and taking all the hot you know the ones you need to take to be really competitive and it turned out I wasn't and so I think you got to have an additional part of the toolbox for those that need that and so that obviously the the virtual environment just like when televisions come in and the internet doesn't replace the teacher, but adds a tool to the toolbox to help them and also reach students where they don't have that resource. So, Mark, I'd like you to take off. What you said perfectly. I, our historical uh, architecture <coughs> the last several years, and that's not just with technology, but with people and what we've grown to expect, um, being hyper connected, is what we call it. And from our digital readiness work, we ask and we know, we don't just count technology, we ask. You know what's the experience like, and what are you doing with the, the devices and digital tools that you have access to? And so we we watch that. We call it, we kind of think of it as action research um, annually. Um, and our districts and, and schools participate really well in this work. And so we watched it. And we see the trend moving. Greater than 90% of our school districts right now offer online virtual courses. Um, that's that's expanding. That's growing. Um, probably not fully offered where it needs to be in all the areas that, that they need to be. Um, so that's a growth area for us. But the connectivity is there, the opportunity is there, uh, the access is there. And then our districts are starting to connect with each other in much greater ways. And so we have, for example, uh, 12 school districts connected together offering uh, computer science courses that all 12 are sharing, but essentially sharing four teachers. Right. Um, so those are experiences that, that we will only continue to expand. And when I look at the average bandwidth per student, it's what, 260, right? So that, that's not a big number. Right. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> like, uh, and that's why part of that, that additional budget request is to deal with the growth, because what's happening is we definitely see a more of a movement to one-to-one, -to -one, uh, which is a good news, to be honest with you, because it moves them out of labs. My complaint, and then we talked about the semester plan, is and my, my older kids went through this. If you're from a school that has only labs, then it really limits you to certain content areas using that to help you with instruction. Uh, 
And that, that 260 kilobits per second per student yeah. is, is what we have available in Kentucky. The national target is 100 kilobits per second per student. Yeah, I just know that if I'm at 260, I'm eight wide. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> but that, but it, 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 to Marty's point, we, it is, we were the first state to achieve that, that goal and that standard, but we see them, that them really taking off with this to use it with construction for, for a variety of reasons. So that's the part of the additional budget request, besides the online you know, testing and the summative testing and cybersecurity, is to help us keep up with that growth. And to be honest with you, historically over the past 25 years, Every 68 years, I have to go before the legislature and ask for an increase in that funding um, to address the bandwidth, the bandwidth growth of our schools. And this is right along that time. Okay. Are there any questions? Any other questions? And is there anything we should have mentioned or asked about that we didn't? I'm not aware. Marty, is there anything in computer science you wanted to bring out that I didn't? Uh, we're excited about a, a national report that, that will be released uh, in the next couple of months that uh, we'll want to share. And, Highlight some growth in Kentucky that we're excited about. Not where we need to be, but it's certainly some momentum that we'll be able to take advantage of moving forward. And I would say this is too is you know, our student technology leadership program, we have a regional and state. I really encourage you to go see those. That's the best exam. I mean, two, two reasons. One is it gives you a chance to interact with students and ask them anything you want, um, which I do about how good our services are. Um, and they'll tell you straight. Uh, so you get it. It's good stuff. They'll be respectful, but they're straight with it. Um, but it just lets you see the, the kind of positive project-based learning uh, that we're getting with these tools. Um, so at the regional and state, we have that. Um, just encourage you to, uh, to check that out. So our, I, our, 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 our IT Academy, Computer Science and IT Academy, we've been able to modify that to offer a wider variety of certification for the students that want those previously. It was just Microsoft, now it's been expanded this year, which I'm pretty, pretty excited about as well. To so actually achieve um, AP? Things as well as um, all valid industry certifications on our industry certification course. And I'll, I'll finish so, with this and I'll let you go. I'll, I'll, I'll toss you out. Nice. The Go Digital effort is besides just, I mean, we, we, we keep up with just not the administrative and the technical, but we really want to make sure this is making an instructional impact and give them, the kids a good run and go at life like we all are. But the part that we really focus on that's really taken off is the Go Digital. And we spend a lot of time mentoring. Uh, and, and, and building capacity of school districts versus doing things for them is our goal. So I'd like you to tell a bit about our Go Digital. If, if you're on Twitter, you, you touch on KY Go Digital as a hashtag. Um, it just gives you kind of a taste of um, a, a design where we want our school and district leaders to lead um, and build capacity, which we know is sustainable. It's not that we can provide professional learning, professional development to every teacher across the state, but it started off as a, um, an, an event-based uh, opportunity where now across the state this summer there were five different events, all led by school and district leaders, um, stepping up to say, hey, here's, here are some things that we are creating for our students, or here's an experience design where our students are creating and making things using technology, um, which is really our end game. Our end game is, as David mentioned, SDLP, and, we also, obviously, super connected uh, with Skills USA and, uh, and other student organizations where it's all about students who make stuff um, and, and not about lecture-based opportunities that our students actually make. And, and you heard a lot about that, that, you know, some of that yesterday about the keys uh, to a good instructional environment is an engaging experience. And I've always viewed as technology can help be one of those great tools in the toolbox and make it much more engaging and be able to reach certain students, and I've given an example a lot of times about, I couldn't understand aerodynamics when I was at West Point, and a, a professor created a, a um, simulation for me to understand lift and drag. And I got it, I got it in a very short period of time. Where, you know, I was afraid I was gonna fail that course, and at West Point, you fail one, you're gone. To show you the difference is, I, you know, my, I pursued being a pilot um, in, in the Army. From, from now I understood it, you have to understand lift and drag to be a pilot, so that you know, I understood that. Um, uh, the concept to, to, to pursue that. Uh, but I do go to Marty's point, and I think the part that this is working on is for students to think for themselves and figure out things for themselves. And, and uh, um, I, I do think this one of the strongest environment, besides you know, having high expectations and being very appropriate, is we're, we're, we're seeing them uh, go toward this to make it a much more engaging and informative environment for, for students. Okay. Thank you.
last point I'll make, uh, Professor Kay, you gave me a softball with the KY Go Digital idea. And, um, that's a three or four year idea that's completely changed. This summer we had over 2,000 adults uh, joined together at different events all throughout the state, um, not getting paid to do that, right? Um, all with the same idea of helping each other connect and share and grow. That, that, that's the idea. Um, we believe that that's possible because of the connectedness in our schools and because things work. Right? We, we don't invest in our time, energy, and money in things that don't work. And so that's, that's one of those growth areas and metrics that we're going to continue to watch and make sure we're achieving the best possible. Yeah, we can go on for hours, but I don't know stuff like So I'm going to see if anyone wants to make a motion to uh, move this forward. All right. All right. So um, everyone uh, who wants to approve uh, KETS K-12 operational technology needs for school year 19 and 20, please say aye. aye. Any nays? And you also just need the same thing, approve the $366 million. It's more than just, uh, it's just, it, it's just saying you approve what the master plan had before. It's the same. It's really good. Okay. Right. Same, same kind of motion. So we need the same, for the same, so we have to approve the 366 yes. also? Okay. Yes. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Well? Well, I think the one you're looking at, the first one is operational needs. The, next the, the one, second one the is second the operational one is the plan, plan, which is the 366. 15.4. Yeah. 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 I was going to see if you wanted to say anything else about the second one then. These <laughs> 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 well, are like brother and sister. That's what I thought. They're yeah, they're still the same. Thing. Okay. So then we need a motion for the second part approval of KETS operational plan for the school year um, 19 and 20. Mm -hmm. sure. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 There you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So then we need a motion to adjourn. All right. Good. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Well done. Appreciate it.